Okay, okay so the, the title of my talk is Coulomb Blockade and Magnetic Effects in Molecular Tunnel Junctions. And this was a work uh, done in collaboration uh, with, uh, first of all, Miguel Sierra, who was at, the, at the, my institute in, um, in Mallorca in Spain. And he just started a postdoc in uh, Würzburg University. And then, uh, so he was, let's say, like the main driving force uh, behind this project because he performed all numerical calculations um, for samples that were um, uh, grown in the groups of uh, our organizers, Enrique Del Barco and Christian Hughes. Okay. So um, probably you don't need this. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, okay, so this is the, the, the outline. Uh, okay, I will uh, briefly, let's say, motivate uh, our work. Okay, then I will explain you our theoretical model to analyze uh, transport mechanism in these uh, molecular junctions. And then I will go to the main, uh, let's say, message of this, uh, of this talk. Um, uh, as I said, uh, you probably don't need these slides, so we are, let's say, all... Uh, motivated to uh, study uh, molecular junctions. Uh, let me just focus on these uh, particular, uh, let's say, keywords, uh, like, um, I mean, transport, transport mechanisms. Here we are interested in a single electron transistor and what is uh, actually the, uh, the nature of the, of the transport resonances. And also on another thing is uh, temperature dependence, right? This is an issue that has been, uh, let's say, uh, discussed in previous talks. So those are the, uh, the molecules. Um, as I said, it's just a single mo uh, molecular junction, which is uh, coupled to two uh, metallic uh, electrodes. Those are uh, electromigrated um, junctions, but I mean, similar experiments or similar measurements uh, uh, can be done with uh, self-assembled molecules. So the molecule is, uh, consists of a, uh, um, an iron, atom, which is sandwiched between these two pentacenes, okay? And then there are some groups here, CH2 groups, which force the uh, molecular level, in this case a homo level, to be located uh, uh, at, the, at the center, right? Uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the iron, okay? And then there are some other units to connect this uh, molecule to the, to the gold electrodes. Uh, this is uh, like a molecular transistor because there's a gate, aluminum gate here. So you can tune both uh, gate, uh, gate voltage and also the, the DC bias or the, the source drain uh, uh, voltage. So those uh, were um, experiments uh, that uh, were reported in this 2016 Nature Communication paper in which the main goal was to study uh, temperature dependence okay, of, the, of the electronic transport. So as you can see, uh, this is the current as a function of uh, gate voltage, and then there is another axis for the, for the temperature. So you can see that uh, they observe uh, two resonances, and then uh, they evolve with temperature in such a way that the current peak decreases with temperature, the current valley increases with temperature, and somewhere in the middle is temperature independent. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, typical from, um, I mean, I'm coming from the, let's say, uh, quantum dot uh, community, and this is something that uh, um, uh, has been known since uh, many, many years. Um, also, these kind of uh, uh, figures, color plots, are also familiar to, to, to you, right? Because this is, um, so here, here blue means uh, low transport, red means high transport, so you can see regions of forbidden transport, or basically uh, very little transport, very little current here, followed by these crosses here, which um, tells you that uh, you have uh, resonances, okay? Uh, actually, there are two resonances, one here and another one which uh, can be barely seen here to, to the right, and as I said, in the middle you have these diamonds, which can be interpreted as, uh, as Coulomb blockade diamonds, but for the moment, uh, we just uh, focus on the fact that we have two resonances, that's all. 
Um, and then uh, this is, uh, again, the current as a function of the gate voltage to show that actually this is, uh, they have some tunability as a function of the, of the gate voltage. You can actually sweep across the, these resonances with the help of this uh, uh, gate voltage. Okay, so um, in this paper, uh, how are these uh, resonances uh, interpreted? Well, um, uh, they take the Landauer formula, or which we know is valid for, let's say, um, scattering approach to, to quantum transport. So you assume that uh, everything is coherent. Uh, the coupling between the molecular level and the left and right electrodes are uh, parameterized with these uh, uh, hybridization constants or uh, broadenings, gamma. Uh, then you have the Fermi occupation factors, both in the left and in the right electrodes. Those functions here are the only functions which depend on temperature. Okay, so all temperature dependence will come from these factors here, okay, which uh, is just uh, given by its standard Fermi Dirac distribution function. And then there is this uh, D of omega, which is basically the, the, the local density of states. Okay, so uh, the way we can approximate this local density of states is by assuming that there is one single level, okay, the single level approximation that uh, uh, has been discussed uh, earlier, with uh, an energy uh, molecular level epsilon, and then within this bright pickner approximation, this is approximated with, uh, with a Lorentzian, which we know it works well for energies around the resonance, okay? And, uh, and yes, I mean, it, it does. I mean, here you have the, the current as a function of temperature. So the dots with error bars are the experimental measurements and the theory are the solid lines. And then for different values of the gate voltage, well, the agreement between the, the theory and the and, uh, and experiment is, is good, okay? So uh, if you want to look at the full curves, then this is experiment, this is theory, and uh, of course, you have to, um, all these parameters you have to fit, but I mean, the agreement is, is, is rather good. Um, the question that came to our mind is that, of course, uh, here you have these Coulomb blockade ions, okay? Um, so, um, one could think, okay, so why, I mean, how is it possible that a non-interacting model works so well? Okay, if uh, in reality for Coulomb blockade, we know that we need electron-electron interactions, okay? And this model does not take into account this. So we try to, um, let's say, try to model or try to reproduce the same results using now an interactive model, okay? And for this, we use a, I mean, just a standard uh, Anderson model, okay? In this case, uh, the contacts are just uh, um, free electrons, okay? Epsilon here is the dispersion for lead alpha. Alpha is just either left or right lead. These are just contact, uh, metallic contacts, okay? So here you can have uh, uh, just plain waves, if you wish, okay? Uh, everything is labeled with a wave number, um, um, uh, let's say index, and also a spin index. The spin is going to be important for, uh, for the rest of my talk. I will uh, discuss this later. And uh, here we have the Hamiltonian for the molecular level, okay? So we have, uh, let's say, the single particle energy, epsilon m. For the moment, we consider just one level, but we will uh, expand this to, to more levels. And then we have uh, the, let's say, the, modi the many body part, okay? So u is the charge in energy. This is also another parameter that we can fit with, with, uh, with experimental data. Basically, it's given by E squared over 2C, where C is the sum of capacitances felt by the electrons uh, here in the molecule, um, because we have capacitive coupling with the left, uh, with the right terminal, and also there is a capacitive coupling with the, with the contact, with the, uh, with the gate contact, with the gate terminal here. And um, we assume that there is, uh, as I said, that the, let's say that the Coulomb repulsion uh, only takes place here in the molecule, okay? There is no Coulomb uh, interaction whatsoever in the metallic contacts because uh, they have very uh, good screening properties, okay? Um, and then, uh, finally, we have the tunnel 
um, Hamiltonian, which uh, couples uh, the, let's say, electrons, the, let's say, localized electrons here with the delocalized electrons in the, in the leads. This T, this T here, uh, okay, I will not call it Hoppings because maybe it's a bit uh, controversial. It was just the tunnel amplitude, okay? And again, this is another parameter of the model, okay? We don't, we don't calculate this, okay? We, try, we just fit this with experimental data. Okay, so uh, now we have the Hamiltonian, now we, we can calculate the, the electric current. Everything here is standard, I mean, w there is no innovation, no theoretical innovation whatsoever. I mean, this is basically, if you wish, uh, um, textbook uh, material. Uh, but okay, I will discuss it just for uh, completeness. So, the occupation, um, um, which is the, the, the observable, right, what we have in, to, to compare with an experiment is just the, the uh, time derivative of the mean occupation in one lead. It doesn't matter whether you focus in the left lead or the right lead because energy conservation, this, the theory that we use is, um, is current conserving, so it satisfies this, uh, that the current in the left contact plus the current in the right contact is zero, which is valid in the, let's say, in the steady state uh, case. Here we just look at, this, at uh, steady uh, quantities. And then we apply uh, the non equilibrium of this function formalist to express this current, which is the current through terminal alpha and for a given spin sigma, in terms of this uh, difference of uh, Fermi functions, as before with the uh, Landauer formula. Uh, this is this uh, factor which takes into account the couplings between the the molecular level and the, and the contacts. And then here we have the imaginary part of the, of the Green's function. This function now contains everything, contains the molecular level energy, contains electron-electron interaction, and contains also the coupling between the different parts of the system. Okay, so this is the, let's say, the key quantity that we have to, to calculate, okay? This is defined in this, uh, in the time domain, this is defined, okay, as, as in many, many theory, usually, okay? But of course, we have to, let's say, Fourier transform this to, to put it into, into this uh, current formula, in this uh, main wing green formula. Broadening is given in terms of the square of this uh, tunnel amplitude, okay? So, but again, this is the density of states in the, in the lead. This is something that we do not calculate. So we take this, all this uh, term uh, broadening as, as a feeding parameter. And then again, the lead Fermi function which depends on energy and also the electrochemical potential in the lead and possibly temperature dependent if you're interested in, uh, let's say, thermoelectric transport. But, but here, uh, temperature, there is a common background temperature. There is no thermal gradient. Okay, so just a few words about how we calculate this Green's function. Again, this is just uh, uh, very much standard. We use the equation of motion technique. So, as, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, you, we have this correlator, which is our Green's function. So, we take the time derivative to the left and we generate additional correlators. Okay, at some point you have to cut your, your, your equations um, and form like a closed set of equations from which one derives this uh, uh, Green's function. Um, this, the, the particular, for those of you familiar with this technique, we follow the Hubbard 1 scheme, well, not exactly the Hubbard 1 scheme, because uh, in our case, the self-energy does not depend on occupation. Um, but the final answer is very transparent, okay? Uh, because what uh, one finds is that the Green's function consists <laughs> of two resonances, because uh, here the Green's function has two poles, one at, let's say, the bare energy or the uh, single particle uh, um, energy level, epsilon m, and another pole, another pole at energy level plus u, plus the charging energy. So let's say one energy level, as we, as we know from Coulomb blockade, is split into one resonance and split into two. Okay? Now, each of these uh, uh, resonance is weighted by the occupation, the mean occupation in the, let's say, if, if, I mean, if you're calculating the Green's function for sigma, then you have to also calculate I mean, this depends on the mean occupation of the of sigma bar, of the, the one with, uh, with opposite spins. And as I said, in this particular scheme, uh, the self-energy here uh, does not depend on occupation, which, I mean, somehow it, it helps when you want to calculate, when you want to, to do your, your, let's say, your numerical simulations. Um, 
The only, let's say, difficulty, but it's not a big thing, is that this is a self-consistent calculation because, as I said, the Green's function depends on this mean occupation and the mean occupation, just by definition, depends on the Green's function itself. Okay, so everything has to be um, calculated in a self-consistent way, but it's not, a, let's say, a, a hard calculation. Again, this is the Fermi occupation in the, in the leads. As, as you know here, as you see here, the occupation in general fluctuates and fluctuates just whenever we cross the resonance. Okay, away from the resonance, this occupation is constant. Okay, so we are in the Coulomb blockade uh, valley, and then uh, we are around the resonance. This number fluctuates. Okay, it's no longer zero one; it's something in the middle. Okay, and also, of course, it's temperature dependent. Um, so I, said, I mean, it's just we have both quantum and, and thermal fluctuations. Now, those are the numbers that we use for the, uh, for the fitting of a numerical, sim a numerical simulation. So, all of them are, let's say, in the range of uh, typical molecular junctions. So, the most important thing is U, the, the charge in energy, which is, let's say, the largest scale of our problem, because it's of the order of almost 100 mil electron volts. And then the gamma mass that we use, we use, um, let's say, um, um, broadenings which are energy dependent, but with a simple uh, energy dependence to, to fit the experimental um, data, is, as you say, much smaller, sometimes even two orders or three orders of magnitude smaller than, than you. Okay? And, um, yeah, so let's, uh, I can show you the, the results here. Uh, this is um, this is now the results with the, with the, with the, the interactive model, okay, including interactions uh, using this uh, Anderson model. So this, uh, let's say, the black curve uh, the experiments, current as a function of gate voltage for a given value of the source drain um, um, voltage or source drain bias, and then for different values of temperature, okay. Blue is the, uh, the theory or the numerical calculations and black is the, um, is the experiment. This is, again, a theory. So you can see this Coulomb diamond here, the, the resonance again. Uh, and here, again, you can see, let's say, a comparison between the current and as a function of temperature for, let's say, for the peak value. This one, uh, the peak value is red, so uh, it decreases with, uh, with temperature. The blue is, no, I think it's the other way around. So the blue is 0.3 electron, minus 0.3 electron volts, so it should be here. So this is the, uh, yeah, this one here. Oh, let me see. Green is 0.9. So one should uh, stay roughly, I think the, the colors do not fit, right? They do not match. But I think red one is minus 0.7, which is this intermediate value, okay? Uh, blue should be, yeah, minus 0.3, which I, which I think is this one, okay, it goes down. And, and, the, and the green one, which is 0.9, uh, should be the valley, okay, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, the dots are uh, the experiment and the solid lines are the, the, the are theory, okay. So this somehow uh, brings us the question is that, with a non-interacting model, uh, the agreement is rather good. With an interacting model, the agreement is also good. So the question is how to distinguish between the two models. Because you have now two competing models, which give you, let's say, um, uh, yeah, uh, like a, a good agreement, okay? But the nature of the excitations in both cases is totally different, okay? In one case, you have just, um, Two resonances, two single particle resonances, two, let's say, molecular levels, while in the second case you have just one molecular level which is split due to electron atom interactions. Okay? And um, of course, I mean, for, in quantum dose, the, the, the answer would be straightforward. So you, you would have interactions, okay? Because usually the, the charge in energy is much larger than the, than, 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 the, than the rest of the levels. But here in molecular transistors, this is not so clear, okay? So, our, let's say, test, or let's say, the way we uh, propose to distinguish between these two, uh, um, let's say, theories, the, the, these two competing theories, 
is by means of a magnetic field. Okay, so this is like a cartoon that uh, tries to explain um, the different magnetic response of uh, non-interacting and interacting molecules to an external magnetic field. So, in a non-interacting case, you have two non-interacting resonances or two non-interacting levels. So, whenever you have a magnetic field, and we here focus just in the Zeeman part, okay, of the of the, of the no, no orbital effects, then each of the, the resonance would be split due to Zeeman splitting. Okay, I think this is uh, more or less clear. In the interacting case, since whenever you, uh, let's say, populate this molecular level with a spin up, the other one, uh, due to Pauli uh, principles, should be spin down, okay? So there should be a different uh, magnetic response. So if this is, let's say, spin up, then this level should be shifted but not split it. Okay, and the uh, let's say upper level or the upper resonance should also shift, but in the in the opposite in the opposite uh, direction. Okay, so uh, this is uh, let's say uh, for the moment everything is theoretical. This is just uh, numerical calculations, and what we do is now when you apply a magnetic field in the non-interacting case would be just uh, let's say that uh, the let's say molecular level would be would acquire, uh, let's, let's say, a, a different energy, which is proportional to the Zeeman splitting, okay? In the interacting case, which now we have all these capacitances and so on, it's also very similar, right? There, there is a Zeeman term now, which uh, is proportional to the magnetic field uh, uh, B, and then this delta S is the change in the spin whenever one electron is added into, you, into your molecule, okay? So, when delta S is positive, then the peak shifts to the left because the gate voltage has to compensate this uh, energy shift. And when delta S is negative, then uh, you obtain the, uh, the, other, the other behavior. Okay, so this is, a, let's say, the interactive model. And then you indeed, indeed observe that the conductance peaks just are shifted under the action of, under the influence of a magnetic field, while in the, the non-interacting model would give you a splitting in the, in, the, in the conductance peaks, okay? So now, I think we have now a method to distinguish between the, these, these two cases. Now we can look at the experiment, okay? Uh, for, the, for the experiment, we don't have so uh, much data, but I think this is, uh, I hope this is, this is enough. Uh, again, is it the same uh, ferrocyanine molecule, the same um, uh, system or the same molecular junction? This is done at, at very low temperatures in this case to have this, because at high temperatures you, you, you lose uh, resolution due, due to thermal smearing. And what you observe now for the conductance as a function of the gate uh, voltage, for zero uh, Tesla you observe these two peaks, again, two resonances. But now when you apply a magnetic field, seven Tesla, you see that this resonance shifts to the right and the other one shifts to the left. Okay, so it seems that uh, now we can say something new, right? That uh, we don't have only two resonances, but uh, these resonances are interacting. Okay, so the nature of, uh, of our uh, molecular, of the transport mechanism is actually due to, to Coulomb blockade, okay? To electron-electron -electron interactions. Actually, we, we can say more because, um, as I said, the occupation, the mean occupation is constant between peaks. Okay, so the, the, the occupation uh, should be uh, constant here, also here, and here. If this is moving to the right, it means that delta S, the increase of the spin, should be plus one half, okay? And we can calculate this from this shift here. And if this is moving to the left, it means that we are again um, uh, changing the, the spin, and most likely it means that we are going from, let's say, iron 3 plus to iron 3, iron 3 plus here to the left of this peak, iron 3 plus here in the middle, and down to iron 1 plus here to the right. So whenever we cross one of these resonances, we are adding one electron to the, uh, to the molecular uh, transistor, okay? And, uh, okay, so I think to, to, to conclude, um, 
we have two models, okay, non-interacting and uh, interacting uh, particles. And the way to distinguish between, between the two we propose is by using a magnetic field, okay, because uh, the response of the, con of the conductance curves are, are, are different, okay, and then we also tested this with, with experiment, which seems to suggest that uh, this is consistent with the fact that uh, this uh, molecular transistor are indeed uh, Coulomb located. Okay? And thank you for your attention. Question?